Hello, Christ Church of the Valley, and welcome to the second devotion from the Book of Romans. Um, we are still in these circumstances where we don't get to be together in person, but again, I have to stress that I'm grateful that we live in a time and a place that we can still meet in some semblance, in some way, uh, reaching to each other, opening the Word of God, and being able to fellowship in that sense. With that, I hope you found the first Evo from the Book of Romans helpful. Here is another devotional from the Book of Romans, and this will be a bit of a longer devotion, and I hope that you find this helpful as well. Now, as we get into reading the Book of Romans here, I do want to try and get away from the idea of reading the Book of Romans through the glasses of Martin Luther. And I have to point out, I'm not the first person to point this out, but in the Western Church, we've had a tendency to read the Book of Romans from Martin Luther's perspective, or perhaps from John Calvin's perspective. And I don't believe that that's the way we're supposed to do it. Now, don't don't walk away from that thinking that Ozzy said Martin Luther was wrong or John Calvin was wrong or something like that. The point is not that. The point is that Paul is the author, a first century Jew writing a letter to a church he's never been to. And we have to try our best to reach that and see a first century Jew's writing. I do believe that if you put on Martin Luther's glasses or John Calvin's glasses, uh, John Calvin specifically, if you read the book of Romans with the five points of Calvinism, uh, as as your mode of reading, you're going to see that then. Of course, I, I would accuse the same thing if you're going to put on Arminian glasses and read the anti-points. Again, uh, Calvinists and Arminianists go to Romans and say, see, here's this verse, it proves our point. No, here's this verse, it po proves our point. Um, that's not my point here. That's not what I want us to do. I want us to try and, as best we can, read Paul. Now, another way that this, this happens, I believe, in the modern church is we read with our Christian cliché glasses on. And uh, we put those on. Those are some of those clichés that if you hang around in the Christian church long enough, you'll pick up. And uh, then we read the text with those over our eyes. Now, what, what, it, what would be a, a, a Christian cliché? Now, um, take, for example, the, the saying that God won't give you more than you can handle. Now, that's not actually in the Bible. Uh, and I don't actually think it's Bible. I don't think it's right. Mostly because if God won't give you more than you can handle, then you can handle everything that comes your way. Ergo, you don't have to trust in God. You don't have to take things to God because you can handle it because God won't give you more than you can handle. Um, I, I don't think that this is a, a good representation of the verse that I think it's trying to refer to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Now, I don't think that Paul is saying there, God won't give you more than you can handle. But I am afraid that if you put on those glasses and you read that text, you're going to see that. Uh, that's a risk that we, we run in several ways, depending on who we listen to and what teachings we we then use to read the rest of the Bible. Now, uh, this happens also in a very popular read today of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Uh, there's a very popular read today that Ezekiel 38 and 39 are describing the War of Armageddon. They're describing this war at the end of time, and uh, I think that there are, are preachers, and in fact, this particular study Bible, I didn't purchase it because I liked the study Bible. I liked uh, the other parts of this Bible. Um, but even this Bible, interpret uh, at least this uh, the study Bible, portion of this Bible interprets 38 and 39 of Ezekiel to be the War of Armageddon. 
Well, I don't think that that's a good read of the text. And let me share with you why I don't think that that's a good read of the text. Let's jump into uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, uh, God is going to bring Gog, G-O-G, against uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, chapter 38, verse 4, I will turn you about and I will put a hook into your jaw. So God is speaking to Gog. And I will bring you out and all of your army, horses and horsemen, all of them spend, splendidly arrayed with great company, with buckler and shield. In case you don't know, a buckler is a small shield. I don't think that we should envision King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and those plated shields. And I'll explain why here in a moment. I don't think we should see metal shields. Uh, but anyways, this great army with horses and horsemen and bucklers and shields and all of them wheeling swords. So notice that this army, horses, horsemen, bucklers, shields, swords. In the next chapter, chapter 39, the war is over. Gog has been defeated. Chapter 39, verse 9. And those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and will make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shield and buckler. That's why I kind of think the the buckler and the shield are predominantly wood because they can be burned bows and arrows, war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will make fires from them. Verse 10, they will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires from the weapons. So I want you to see that there in Ezekiel 39. Uh, when this war being described as over, the people will go out and they'll make fires with the weapons. So they're going to be burning the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the war clubs and the spears, and they're not going to need to gather wood from the forests to make fires. Now I want to ask you a question. The war being described here, does it sound like modern warfare? Does it sound like future warfare? Or does it sound like ancient warfare? If you ask me, it sounds like ancient warfare because horses and horsemen, swords and shields, bows and arrows, clubs, those don't sound like modern warfare. Those sound like ancient warfare. And if you have on the glasses that tell you Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about a futuristic war, you might miss those things that say, um, I don't think he's talking about a futuristic war. So with that being said, I really want to get into the book of Romans, and I really just want to try and hear Paul. So let's jump into the book of Romans, chapter 1, and we're going to go through verses 8 through 17 this time. Uh, so let's pick it up here in verse 8. Now this time around, I might not deal with the verses one at a time. And in fact, uh, we are going to group them together because I think Paul has a continuous thought that transcends where we've uh, versified the text. But picking it up in uh, chapter 1, verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. I would have liked to have listened to the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm going to suggest that Paul, like me in some cases, his mouth gets moving faster than his brain allows for. There have been times that I've been preaching or I've been teaching and I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to say the Old Testament, but something happens between my brain and my mouth and I say the New Testament. Or I'm going to say Matthew, but I accidentally say Mark. Um, here Paul begins with first. And it's the same kind of first that if you and I were dialoguing and I was to say, well, first of all, da, 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 da. And second of all, da, 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 da. It's that kind of first. But you'll notice here in chapter one, there's no second. So I kind of wonder if Paul, you know, forgot that he began with first of all. Um, Paul points out prayer. This is not uncommon in the rest of the Pauline corpus. We see this in other Pauline letters that he prays for people. He prays for churches. And that's very important. But look at what he says. First of all, I thank my God. This is powerful because already here in Romans chapter 1, he's referred to God as the Father, but here he's referring to God in the my God, the very personal sense that that's who he's speaking to, not just the power, not just the God, but my God. 
Now, is Paul using hyperbole when he says that the faith of the Roman church is being proclaimed throughout the whole world? It's possible that Paul's using a bit of hyperbole, but I want you to think about the fact that the, that old saying, all roads lead to Rome. Well, what would that indicate then? If all roads lead to Rome, then also all roads lead away from Rome. And it's very possible that Paul is constantly hearing because of the travel in the Roman Empire, because of the road system, it's possible he's constantly hearing about the faith of this church in Rome. And I, it reminds me of what Jesus says in Mark chapter 13, verse 10, that the gospel must be preached to all nations. And I think that Paul is seeing this happen in his very day back here in the first century. Now this time we're going to take 9 and 10 together. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making requests if perhaps at least at if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. Um this, this word here for uh, God whom I serve with my, uh, in the preaching of the gospel of his son. This word serve also connotates worship. And this worship that Paul sees going on in his life uh, has to do with the preaching of the gospel of his son. Now, you'll notice in the New American Standard that preaching of the is in italics. And that means that that's not there in the Greek. And you may be thinking, well, why is it there then in the English if it's not there in the Greek? Well, uh, Greek syntax is different than English syntax. And uh, later here in this very same chapter, in this very same section that we're going to be in, Paul is going to emphasize his preaching. We've seen elsewhere in the Pauline corpus his emphasis on preaching. Woe to me if I do not preach. And so the sentence doesn't exactly translate into English when it comes to whom I serve in the gospel of his son. Well, how do you serve him? How do you worship him in the gospel of your son? Well, in preaching the gospel of your son. Uh, another very likely sense could be how the gospel has changed Paul's life. The, the gospel took Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of the church, and turned him into the Jesus freak, to use a modern term. I just realized I used a cliche, and perhaps I should not do that because I just preached against not using cliches. But that being said, the power of God in the gospel to transform life, and Paul sees this as a form of worship. Uh, now, here Paul specifically says that God is my witness. Now, that could be tantamount to taking an oath, which is very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you about your prayer life. I, I, you could ask me about my prayer life. Uh, am I willing to take an oath that I've been faithful and constantly praying for this church I've never been to? I, I can't take that oath because I have to say that uh, in certain cases, perhaps I've prayed for a church that I knew about over there once, but I don't think that I've preached or I don't think that I've prayed for them continually. Now here, though, ever since I've been here at Christ Church of the Valley, there I would dare say that I would take an oath, God as my witness, that I continually pray for this church. But look at what Paul's doing. Paul's preaching, praying. Paul is praying for a church he's never actually been to, uh, making mention of them in, in in prayer. If perhaps the way is finally opened. God is finally going to make it happen that Paul gets to go to this church in Rome. And there I hear Paul's language once again from verse 1 of being a bondservant. Uh, I, I hear the voice of Jesus saying, Not my will, but your will be done. Paul not putting his uh, own initiative, his own wants, but saying that if it's God's will that now at last the door is open that he may reach uh, this Roman church. Getting back to the text, I'm uh, going to pick it up in verse 11, and we're going to go from 11 and 12, and we're going to put 11 and 12 together. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Verse 12, that is, that I may encourage 
that I may be encouraged together with you while amongst you, each of us by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Uh, this can be a little bit hard to translate into uh, English. Um, Paul's a little bit redundant here, but uh, when Paul talks about a, a spiritual gift that, that he's going to bring to this church, now, I don't believe that Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit that he talks about elsewhere in like 1 Corinthians and other letters. Uh, I think that Paul is seeing some different kind of, of uh, spiritual gift. First of all, it, do, it wouldn't make sense in Pauline theology for Paul to bring one of the charismatic spiritual gifts to them because Paul has never talked about him having the, the ability to bestow those gifts. In Pauline theology, uh, it's always the Spirit which gave those kinds of gifts. And so I don't think, and especially because um, here in the text, uh, we, we don't have a definite, we have an indefinite uh, spiritual gift. I don't think that Paul is speaking of those charismatic gifts. I think that he's thinking of more like a general spiritual gift. And there I kind of think, well, what could it be? Now, it could be that Paul is going to bring to this church a bit more of a Pauline understanding of the gospel. Uh, here, throughout the book of Romans, you're going to see Paul break down the barrier between the Jew and the Gentile. You're going to see Paul theology that all people are sinners in need of God. Uh, and going back to that that idea that I expressed in, in the first video of how the church in Rome was established. Going back to Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, uh, the proselytes uh, and, and the Jews that are in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost uh, hear Peter preach. And Peter's preaching from Acts chapter 2 is repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, for the promises are for you and for your children. That is, the Jewish promises to the Jewish people and the proselytes here in, in this place. And so did they take that message back to Rome and establish the church? But is there some kind of Jew-Gentile division in the Roman church? Moreover, uh, with that Petrine theology from Acts chapter 2, is Paul going to give a much more uh, universal application of the gospel because remember that Peter I'm not putting Peter's preaching down I'm not putting Peter's message down but Peter was preaching to Jews and proselytes that day uh, on uh, Acts chapter 2 whereas Paul the apostle to the Gentile is making the message applicable to all people not just to Jews but to Gentiles also now Paul is very wise in how he worded this as he comes to this church I've got something to bring to you, but this isn't just a one-way street. I also want to receive from you. And I think about my own life. Now, back when I lived in Oregon, I looked forward every year to Mission for Mexico because it was then that I got to see these two guys, Ben and Dakota, and I only got to see them about, you know, two or three times a year. And they were, were uh, one was a youth pastor and one was a, a worship pastor and uh, both good guys. And it was on this mission trip then that I, I would get to chat with them, but I would also get to hear from them. And so it was never just, hey, listen to what Ozzy can teach you about. I want to hear what you guys have been doing. What have you been learning? And I think that that's so important. Coming here from the great apostle, apostle to the Gentiles, yes, I'm going to bring you a message, but I'm also going to be fed. I'm also going to be nourished from your faith. And that's an important thing uh, in the church today. Now, getting back to uh, the, the Romans text, we're going to do 13, 14, and 15 all together. So, picking up in verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may attain, obtain some fruit amongst you also, even as amongst the rest of the Gentiles. Verse 14, I am under obligation both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach uh, the gospel to you also who are in Rome. 
I find this interesting. It's very Pauline language that that uh, you see here in uh, this section of Romans. Uh, you'll remember that in First Timothy, excuse me, First Thessalonians chapter two verse eighteen, Paul has expressed that he's wanted to get back to Thessalonica. But in that case, he specifically says that Satan had prevented him. Whereas here, Paul is talking to his church in Rome, and he wants to get to it. But he doesn't say that uh, Satan has hindered him. Instead, Paul has seen his ministry work in the eastern side of the empire as to being why he hasn't made it out west yet. Whereas now, he's hoping, like we saw previously, that God is going to open the door for him to get there. But he wants to establish with the church, it's not that I've been ignoring you this whole time. I've wanted to come to you, but... I've had obligations in the East. Now, perhaps that door is being opened. Uh, Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware there in verse 13. How many times do you see this in Paul's letters? You see this constantly. And it has to do with Paul basically saying, I don't want you to miss this. I want you to get this. This is very important. Uh, and he says that uh, he, he's obligated both, verse 14, he's obligated both to the Greek and to the barbarian. This word here in uh, the Greek, uh, it basically w would mean somebody who lives in the Greek, or, or excuse me, who lives in the, the Hellenistic Roman Empire, so the Greekified, if, if I can use that word, uh, the, the Greekified and, and you can see in this almost this, this Jewish way of referring to things, but doing so in a Greek sense. What, what do I mean by that? Well, you've got to remember that in the Jewish worldview, there were two groups. There were Jews and there were non-Jews. And so everybody then who, who fits that non-Jew is the Gentile. Now what Paul has done here is, is I'm obligated both to the Greek and to the barbarian. So he's taken that twofold system and he's pointing out that the same prejudices exist in the Hellenistic world. That there are the Greek and there are the non-Greek. So those who live in the empire but don't speak Greek, both to the wise and to the foolish. And you've got to see that we too can fall into that very trap in our modern day. You know, Paul sees himself as, as, as obligated to preach to those who speak Greek and to those who don't speak Greek to the, those who the, who the world sees as wise and those who the world sees as foolish. And that's a good, good thing to point out, that the world sees people as wise and foolish as we jump into uh, 16 and 17. Now, 16 and 17, they've sometimes been called the theme of the book of Romans. I don't disagree with that, but look at what Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. What would it be that might cause shame when it comes to the gospel. Well, if you're of the opinion that uh, somebody disagreeing with somebody else, oh, you voted for that person, that person is stupid, that means you're stupid, or, oh, you view the world that way, that's a stupid way to view the world, so you're stupid. If you think that that's only a modern uh, example of bad argument, no, that argument has probably gone back to... Uh, age and eternity and stuff. Uh, you've got to remember, when Paul is writing this, what has Paul already been through? We saw in the, the, the book of, of Acts that Paul preached to the Areopagus, and as he's preaching to the wise and to the learned there in Athens, he gets to the part about the resurrection, and he loses most of his audience because the resurrection strikes them as foolishness. Now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul, chapter 1, Paul uses the word foolishness quite a bit, and he refers to it as the cross it is a message of foolishness. To the Jew, it's a stumbling block, and to the Greek, it's, it's foolishness. And that's because uh, in, in first century Judaism, there, there wasn't a dying Messiah. And so for Paul to be running around preaching to Jews, 
that a dead Messiah was actually really the Messiah, and by the way, he was risen from the dead, that's a stumbling block to Jews because in Jewish theology, the Messiah is not supposed to die. Not only that, he's not supposed to rise from the dead. The resurrection is something that will happen way in the future. It's not something that happens here and now. And to the Greek, the resurrection, somebody coming back from the dead in a literal sense, that's foolishness. People don't come back from, from the dead in a literal sense. And so that's what Paul is saying, that the, 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 the message of the gospel incurs people to mock it. If you think that that's just something that happens today, that's something that happened there in the ancient world. And Paul sees that although that happens, that's not going to make him ashamed because he sees in it the death, the burial, and the resurrection of God. He, excuse me, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He sees the power of God to salvation. Salvation to who? To everybody. First to the Jew because God began the the endeavor with the Israelites and then extended that now in, in, in the New Testament to the Gentiles. For the gospel is the righteousness of God or a righteousness from God. And how is this obtained? It's obtained by faith. And Paul quotes Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you pronounce it, is probably right but the righteous man shall live by faith. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, there's a generalization of faith here. A How will the man of God be preserved? He will be preserved by his faith, by his belief in God. And Paul sees in that generalization something that he can bring to a specific. The man of God will be justified. How will he be justified? Not by Torah. A first century Jew saying that a man will not be justified by Torah? No, not by Torah. How then? By faith. And with that, we're going to wrap up the second uh, devotional here from the book of Romans. I hope you join us again. We're going to get into this next section of Romans. And you're going to see Paul deliver a very Jewish critique of the Gentile world. So join us again and we'll get into that. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that this was encouraging to you and I hope that we can continue to encourage each other during this time.